Hey, I'm Andrew Joseph Keith, and in this video, I'm gonna be doing a little question and answer, as well as working on a little maquette, a little tiny gesture study sculpture with this armature. Okay, before we get into it, there's a couple of really important announcements. First off, obviously, there's the new Proco site, Proco 2.0, which is what this is all about. And it's free to set up an account. So if you haven't done that, what are you doing with your life? You gotta go over there, you gotta make the account, it's free to do so, and then you can start joining in the community, and we're really building something special over there at Proco.com. And then also, at Proco.com, there's a new course, the Proco Figure Sculpting Fundamentals course. I'll be your instructor, and I'll walk you through everything that I wish I would have known when I started sculpting. It's at a 20% pre-sale discount, which ends on the 8th, the 8th of June. So be sure you get it before then if you wanna take advantage of that discount. Join all those that have already gotten the course. Thank you so much that have already purchased for those that have already purchased. On the 9th, we're starting releasing the lessons. And so there'll be a free lesson on the 9th, which will also introduce a sculpture challenge, which will have some prizes. So I'm really excited for that. And, and the videos will start on the 9th. They will be put on the new Proco YouTube channel. And so that's another thing. If you're, if you're not following the Proco 3D channel, go and follow that if you're interested in sculpture. That's where we'll be posting all of the sculpture content. So if you're interested in sculpture, either digital or traditional sculpture, go over to the Proco 3D channel and follow that. Okay, as far as what I'm using as materials, I'm gonna be using this wire armature that I built ahead of time. This is about 11 and a half centimeters tall, so it's a pretty small armature. It's gonna be fairly easy to build out the forms and everything, and that's what I wanted for this project. Um, I have some clay that I haven't warmed up. It's just cool clay, Chavant, medium, NSP. And so I want it to be a little bit firmer because this is a smaller sculpture. It'll help if the pieces are a little bit firmer and I'll just be doing it by hand. Probably won't use a lot of tools. If I do use a tool, I have uh, this, my favorite tool. And, uh, and so I can push the clay around if my fingers aren't working quite right uh, to move that clay. And so that's what I'm using as materials. As far as the reference that I'll be using, I'm just gonna be using something from George Bridgman's book, uh, Complete Guide to Drawing from Life. And I chose in this, let's see, can you see it on that camera? I've chosen this drawing right here. And so that'll just be the reference that I'm using, just one Dr Bridgman drawing. And I like doing this exercise. This is one of the exercises in the premium course because it's good to be able to try to draw out from a well done drawing. Uh, all the information you can and see how you can represent it in 3D. And so I've found that a good drawing is often better than a photograph. And so you'd think a photograph would have more information, but if it's a really well done drawing, like Bridgman's drawings, where they're very structural, they're very blocky, you know, you really, he really understands the forms. And so I find them more helpful often than like a super uh, realistic photograph might be or if you just had one angle, you know, I, I, I really like this exercise. And so um, if you guys aren't on Proco.com, you gotta go over, you gotta sign up for Proco.com. It's free to sign up. That's where the, the figure sculpting fundamentals course is gonna be. So I, I asked for some help at Proco.com and you guys responded. And so that's kind of um, what I'll be talking about as I do the question and answer. And, and then I'll be working on this sculpture at the same time. Just a few more things before we get into the, uh, the sculpting aspect of it. I'm just, just to let you know about my thought process, I'll try to build out the primary forms, so the head, the rib cage, and the pelvis. And then once I have those figured out, then I'll try to really capture the pose and, and having those basic primary forms ahead of time with clay will help me as I'm trying to, to capture that pose accurately. And then I'll just continue to build up the mass as best I can with that one reference. So let's get into it. Okay, so I wanna make sure that you can see I'm doing two cameras. So I wanna make sure you guys can see what I'm, what I'm working on. So at first, I'm just gonna kinda put it in a neutral pose. Um, there's some, you know, curve of the spine, 
but pretty, pretty neutral as far as the armature goes. And then I'm just going to be adding clay. Okay, let's get into these, these questions. Let's see, the, the first question is from Joao Bogo. I don't know how to pronounce that, but uh, that's what it looks like. And he says, I would like to know more about making molds. Is there any books or course on that? I can't seem to find any. Yeah, mold making is a tricky thing. It's a, it's a very difficult thing, and it could probably be its own course. I do do some lessons in the, the figure sculpting fundamentals course on my process for mold making. And so I, I'll show you a couple simple methods for making a two-part mold. But if you're really interested, I'd look up the YouTube channel of Eric Arneson. Eric? Eric Arneson. And he's another sculptor and he does videos. He also has a Patreon channel where he goes over mold making on figures. And, um, and so that's a really helpful resource. There's also a YouTube channel called Brick in the Yard Mold Supply. And they, they have uh, materials that are professional materials for mold makers to use. And they also produce content that shows you how to make the molds. And so if you're really interested in mold making, I highly recommend those two resources. They should be uh, really helpful uh, to learn about mold making. It is complicated and you make a lot of mistakes. I'd recommend using cheaper materials. That's what I go over in the, the figure sculpting fundamentals course. I use some cheap silicone and kind of show you my process for making a mold. And if you can get it down with cheap materials, then you can move up to the higher quality materials that'll last longer. And so that's just, that's just what I, I recommend because it's so frustrating to get, you know, some expensive materials and then work out a mold. And then you found that you made a mistake and you wasted a hundred dollars worth of materials just making one mold. And so, uh, so that's why I recommend cheap stuff first. And there is a lesson on the figure sculpting fundamentals course. So be sure you're, uh, aware of that and be become a premium member. It's not that, it's not that much. And, uh, and it's a ton of information. Let me. Trying to make sure that I that you can see me on both cameras. Okay, Bogdan, Bogdan. Ask. I have two questions. If that's fine, though, the first one has more priority. If I had to decide, what should a beginner sculptor put most of his focus on? What pitfalls should be avoided at all costs? Well, at all costs, really. Um, I don't know if there's any sculpting pitfalls that should be avoided at all costs. I mean, what if it costs you your family? What if it costs you your, your life? You know, was it worth it? So I don't know if there's any sculpting mistakes, mistakes that should be avoided at all costs. But there are some, some uh, beginner mistakes that are pretty common and... Like the first one that comes to mind is just not using a reference at all. And so just sculpting from your imagination. You know, I did the same thing when I was starting out sculpting. Uh, when I started sculpting, I would often just like think, oh, I'm just going to sculpt a face. And so you just sculpt a face with no, with no references or anything to guide you. And, you know, the, the less references you have, you just have to make up more material. You have to make up more of those forms and they're not as easy as you think. As you imagine, you think, oh, I know what a nose looks like, but do you really? I mean, do you really know what it looks like to the point where you can recreate it? It takes a lot of study and a lot of practice. And so having good references, that's something that I'll talk about um, that's really important. And that's a beginner mistake that I see a lot. But there is one lesson that goes over well, it's broken up into a couple lessons that talks about a bunch of beginner mistakes and how to avoid them, and, and that's in the course as well. But, you know, uh, make sure you have good references, other things, you know, focus on the primary forms first. Those are things like, like this that I'm doing, building out a small version of the head, the rib cage, and the pelvis. Those are primary forms, uh, and they give structure when you build the secondary forms like anatomy, like the details, like the texture, like the skin folds, all of that, those are secondary and, and tertiary forms. But if the primary forms aren't established from the beginning, then those, the, all that detail, it doesn't, it doesn't do a lot of good. And so I'd say, you know, really focus on getting those primary forms correct. 
The second part of his question is, I'm interested in an interdisciplinary approach to art. Both drawing and sculpting are among my interests. My question is, how can, I, can we best integrate the two disciplines? Meaning, how can we progress in one, mean progress in the other? While we progress in the other, I think. Um, so that's a, that's a good question. And I think sculpting and drawing really play off each other. They're, they're not two separate disciplines, even though one is in 2D and one is in 3D. They're really closely related because sculpting is basically just drawing in space. You're really just focusing on drawing an outline from one angle in space. And, um, and drawing in your sketchbook, you know, being able to draw, being able to observe something and draw it accurately and find the forms and find the flows, uh, whether it's in 2D or 3D, you know, they, they really play off each other quite a bit. And, and so I'd say, keep doing both and, and they'll, you'll, your drawings will get better as your sculptures get better. And vice versa, your sculptures will get better as you improve your drawings. I've been focusing mostly on sculpture, but I do want to get back into drawing because I love drawing. That's what first got me interested in Proco. And I thought Stan, you know, he does a great job with his courses. And so, you know, do both because they really play off each other. And, you know, great artists, Michelangelo, um, uh, Bernini, all of these artists, they were able to represent things, they were able to draw well. Uh, and, and so that, that's an important skill. Um, let's see, so here you can see the start of the rib cage and the kind of a simplified Loomis head. So I'm almost ready to start trying to capture the pose, but I'm going to do a little box for the pelvis and then, and then I'll try to capture the pose a little bit more. Okay, Kiff asked, hi, what are the possible roles of sculpting in an artistic in an artist's career. To sell the final product, make maquettes for projects. Thank you and have a nice day. So, um, what are the roles for sculpting? So, there's a lot of different, and there's a few questions that are similar to this, but there's a lot of different um, careers that, that have to do with sculpting, whether it's, you know, design, whether it's product design, where you're designing the shape of different products, um, or uh, you know, designing cars so that they're aesthetically pleasing, so that they look good, and and then as well as traditional sculpting, and so going to shows, doing figure sculptures, and and selling those as finished sculptures, works of of bronze. You know, so it really depends on what you're interested in, and so I'd find somebody that that inspires you, that you like their work, and then try to learn what you can from their style. And, and from them. And so, uh, and, and contact them and, and ask them, like, what do you do uh, as far as making, making your money? And how would you recommend somebody like me get started at that? And so it really, it really depends on what type of sculpting you're interested in. There's a lot of sculpting and special effects for, for movies and things like that, uh, where you need to know things that, that um, will have been gone over in the, in the anatomy course. You need to know anatomy. You need to know all of these different things. And even things like character design, sculpting is often where they start at, at creating a new character for, you know, uh, for uh, 3D animation. Often they start with traditional sculpting methods, uh, you know, or, or they'll do it on, on the computer if they're familiar with, with uh, ZBrush and other things. But you really have to figure out like what are you interested in, and then and then learn more about that specific field. That's what I'd recommend, as as um, if you're if you're starting out and wondering how can I how can I make this into a career. Okay, dear Andrew, uh, this was uh, Ramona Vasanska by Sanska. I apologize for mispronouncing names. And so uh, I probably will and will continue to do so. 
Dear Andrew, first of all, let me say how happy I am that Proco has you as an instructor. Thank you. I appreciate that. I have several questions. I might repeat some of the questions that others have asked. Uh, I hope to increase the chance. Uh, hopefully that increases the chance that you'll answer them. Okay. What materials, tools, and learning methods slash sources would you recommend for an absolute be beginner? Um, so obviously, as the instructor for the Figure Sculpting Fundamentals course, I highly recommend that course. I started it off with the, with the intention to give you all of the information that I wish I would have had right when I started sculpting. And so you, you can start without knowing basically anything about sculpture. And then if you, if you do the course, if you follow the assignments, you will know quite a bit about sculpture and you'll know about the materials, you'll be able to recreate um, the, the figure. And, and so I really recommend that course, getting the premium uh, version of that course and, and doing the assignments, sending them in so that I can do critique videos. Uh, anybody that's interested in the course, uh, please, just like Stan did, I'll be doing critique videos. And so uh, take pictures of your work, send it in, and I'd love to see those and, and get those. Um, be I, I'd love to I'd love to have those because it helps other people to see common mistakes and mistakes that they might be making and then seeing you know how to address those and so yeah if you're an absolute beginner I recommend starting with the Proco figure sculpting fundamentals course it should be very helpful that's what I made it for um, what can you recommend regarding materials tools and learning sources for somebody who wants to learn to create small size figurines um, you know, that's what I'm that's what I'm doing here. If you're doing a small figurine, depending on what what you want to do with it after you might instead of be using or instead of using oil clay like I'm using right here, uh, you might use polymer clay so that you can bake it and then it's hard so you can paint it with acrylic paint afterwards. And so um, as far as the materials go, you might use different materials, but the principles of sculpting apply to whatever type of sculpture you're doing. And there's even a lesson that talks about uh, abstraction and you know whether you're making if you're making figurines you might have an element of abstraction that makes it you know maybe more cute or a little bit more simple depending on what type of figurines you're going for and so um, so yeah I, I'd say you know the principles apply to whatever type of sculpting that you're doing even non figurative work uh, the the principles taught in the course will apply do you have any experience with making molds? So I talked about this a little bit. I gave you those, those resources. I really recommend that. Um, Eric Arneson on YouTube, and then also Brick in the Mold, uh, Brick in the Yard Mold Supply. Those I really recommend. Let me come back to this because I, I think I have kind of a version of, you know, a simple box for the pelvis, the rib cage, and the head. And so now I can worry about capturing the pose. And so I'm going to, to try to do that. So the head's kind of turning this way. There's quite a bit of bend in the back. The shoulders are kind of pressed back and you can actually, you know, if you're trying to capture a pose, you might take the pose yourself just to get a feel for it. And, and that's a, a good exercise, something that's good to, to do often. Let's see, this arm looks like it might be straighter and it's kind of pushing this way. Um, I'm kind of seeing more of, of this arm, which is up, it's up, and then he's kind of maybe flexing the, the bicep a little bit over here, and so this, this hand is bent inward, let's see. And then as far as the legs go, this one's coming this way, this one's pointing forward, let's see. And so I'm just trying to, to capture that pose. And I can, I can still modify it even after adding clay. And so I'm not, I'm not super stressed about getting it exactly right, right at this point. I can, I can always adjust it later on. And I'm just trying to get it pretty, pretty accurate. And then ca capture some of the, the gesture that is in place from this pose. Okay, I think that's about, about good.
Okay, if so, what materials are suitable for... Um, wait, wait, okay. If, if so, what materials are suitable for making sculptures and then using those sculptures to make molds? Do you have any experience with using molds to create resin or porcelain sculptures? Um, yeah, I've, I've cast sculptures in resin, and so that's usually the, the material I like to use, and it, it works really nice. And so, um, yeah, there's a, a lesson on that. Simple mold making techniques, cheap mold making techniques so that you can start, start cheap and then uh, build your way up to more expensive, more higher quality mold making materials. Okay. Do you have experience painting the finished sculpture of polymer clay or resin or porcelain? I don't, and so usually I don't uh, paint my works. I kind of want the sculpture to stand on its own, but I'm not against it. I think, I think uh, depending on what you're going for, it sounded like you were going for figurines, and so, yeah, that's, uh, that's perfectly legitimate, and I've known sculptors that do. They, they paint on top of the, either the polymer clay or the resin, and, you know, they, they do a great job. And so if you're interested in that, um, yeah, just, just go for it, you know, learn what you can about people that, that do that technique, that paint the, the figure after they've sculpted it. And, uh, that's, uh, a good thing to do if, if that's the, the result that you're looking for at the end. With most of mine, I kind of want the, the forms to speak for themselves. And so I don't, uh, I don't, I haven't painted them a lot. Uh, yet and so kind of like a bronze piece where it's a similar color there might be a patina on it but I just kind of want the the sculpture to speak for itself mostly um, but that's just this my style okay let's see side shave Laura Laura side shave Laura Laura How can the ability to sculpt translate into career opportunities? What are some of the sculpting jobs we don't know about? So I've uh, talked a little bit about this, some of the, the opportunities. Um, I, just, I just went online and Googled, you know, jobs relating to sculpture and some of the jobs that were available. And there were a bunch, um, things like uh, uh, working on, on special effects, special effects, sculpting, um, you know, designing, designing products, things like that, just being able to make molds and cast things for people in production or in prototyping, that's a really useful skill. And so there are a lot of things. Again, what I'd recommend is figuring out what you want to do specifically, because, um, because there are so many things and so many ways that you can apply this. Like, are you interested in going to shows and selling sculptures as, as works of art, as fine art? Are you interested in being in galleries or are you interested in, you know, being a part of movies and creating characters that are interesting and, you know, characters for 3D? Um, you know, those, those things are really blowing up right now. There's, there's a, a bunch of demand for talented people that can do those jobs. And so you really have to find out what you're interested in specifically. And then if you can, I really recommend finding finding somebody who does what you want to do and and then trying to get in contact with them and learn from them. And so like for example, what is what is a a semester of college cost? Like maybe at the low end, maybe 3 4000, 3 or $4000. If you said to somebody who's a professional sculptor working in the field, let's say they're a bronze sculptor, "Hey, hey, I'm going to be in your area." I'm a student looking to learn about your craft and look, looking to, to learn uh, the lessons that, that you know and, and more about what you do. Um, I'd be willing to just come and work for you as, as a free intern. I'll, I'll do all the work that you don't want to do. Let me be there. Let me be just kind of a fly on the wall for a couple weeks, two or three weeks. And, you know, that would be cheaper probably than a semester of college. You just go to wherever they're at, you know, and, and, um, and then, you know, find a place to stay for a couple weeks. And 
if you could do that, you would learn more than a semester at college, but just by being around somebody that's doing what you want to do. And so that's something where that, that people have the ability to do, but there's very few people willing to reach out. And some artists will say, no, they don't have the time or they, they don't want to, you know, take on that responsibility, but maybe one out of 10 of the artists that you really admire uh, would say yes. And so that means you only have to ask 10 people if you can work with them, if you can observe them and help them out and, and, and just let them know, you know, I'll do all the stuff that you don't want to do. I'll help you with whatever cleaning up, you know, uh, making molds, whatever is tedious and you don't like doing, I'll do it. Just show me how. And, and then, and let me ask you questions. And you could even, if you're good at social media, you could even say, you know what, I'll record some of the answers that you do. I'll record you in your studio and give it to you for free so that you have uh, posts that you can post on social media uh, into the future. And so a lot of artists um, are too busy to post on social media, but they understand that it is good to post. And so if you were willing to take over that part for an artist and do some of the things that they don't want to do, there, there are many artists that would be willing to give people an opportunity to do that. And so I'd, I'd highly recommend um, thinking out of the box that way and, and working with people that are in the, in the job that you want to be in and that are successful doing it. Uh, because you can more, learn more from them than college teachers that went into teaching. So. Okay. Key Seegerson. K.E. Seegerson. Um, where should an absolute novice start? Uh, I think I've kind of talked about that a little bit. Start with the course. <laughs> It'll be great. Uh, I'm really excited for it. And so, um, yeah, it, it should be just really helpful for anybody that's interested in learning to sculpt. And so, figure, figure sculpting fundamentals course, start there. And from there, you know, you can go so many places. Um, can anatomy from knowledge in 2D translate to 3D, to the 3D world? Uh, absolutely. That was a question from Mahdi Muhammad. And absolutely, you know, the knowledge that I got from watching and learning about anatomy has been really valuable to me as a sculptor. I find that you actually need to know, you need to know it like Stan knows it if you're going to sculpt it because you can't just know the muscle from one angle. You have to understand how that muscle wraps around the figure, how it how it moves through space, where it inserts and where, you know, all of those things, the the shape of it, all of those things are helpful for sculptors because anatomy is complicated and the body's complicated. So the more you know, uh, the better you'll be at at representing the figure in 3D. And with things like this, this is a great exercise because it lets you know what you don't know. And so if you have a hard time with the back, if you're thinking like, okay, what, what, what are the forms of the back? What is going on back there? Then that gives you something that you can study, that you need to study. So good question. And absolutely, the knowledge is transferable. Christopher Lincoln asks, uh, what types of clay are used and what kinds of sculpture oil-based clay, polymer clay, wax, etc. So it depends on what you're doing. Um, I do have a lesson that goes specifically over types of clay and, and their advantages and disadvantages. And so that's a er uh, uh, lesson early on. But for now, I'd just say, you know, experiment, buy a little bit of different types of clay and see what you like, because a lot of the clays can be used for similar purposes. I mean, you can use water-based clay the way that I'm using um, oil-based clay right now. It would be a little bit difficult because this small scale water based clay tends to dry out pretty fast. And so, um, so, you know, keeping things like that in mind, like when, when to use one material versus another, um, I'll, I'll go through that in the, in the course. And then I also, yeah, I just recommend getting a little bit of each type of clay and experimenting, experimenting with it, but don't get too much because, uh, clay can be expensive depending on the type of clay. And you might not even like it as much as another another type. So, um, Christopher Lincoln again asking, "What is your favorite clay to work with, and why?" Th this is the the one I like. It's Chavant Medium NSP. I like it because it feels less oily than other types of plastiline or um, you know non 
clays that don't dry out. And so oil-based and wax-based clay, it just leaves my hands feeling less sticky and oily, oily than, than other clays. So this is what I like. And I actually mix a little bit of hard clay in with the medium clay. Okay, the question by, another question from Christopher Lincoln. Um, working in scale, the challenges of working full size and small scale. So the challenges of working on a smaller scale like this is it's just hard to get into the details, um, but you know things can be off a little bit and you don't notice as much because it is such a small scale. Like if you took a gesture study this size and then scanned it 3D and blew it up to life size, you'd see a bunch of mistakes that you just didn't realize were there when it was a small scale. And so that's something you have to realize working on a small scale is you know things might be off just a millimeter or a couple millimeters, but you blow that up and you know those mistakes become really obvious. And that is the, the way a lot of professional sculptors work is they do a smaller maquette, then they um, scan it in 3D and have people carve it out of foam. And then they have those, those foam sculptures that they then add clay onto to make monuments. And so that's uh, an interesting process that I'd like to learn more about. Um, I, I myself would like to uh, train with some some local Utah uh, artists and sculptors that do monuments because I think that's a, a really cool process. But it is expensive, you know. It's very very expensive and very um, very time consuming working that size. Li the bigger you go, the more time it takes. And so be aware of that. You also need to use like a softer clay if you're using oil based clay, which most of the professionals that I know do use a soft oil-based clay when they do life-size. Um, but, you know, it, it depends on what you're, what you're going for. If you can sell it, you know, life-size, you'll make more money doing bigger sculptures that you can charge more for. Um, but there might be advantage to a smaller sculpture that, more peop that is in more people's price range and that they can fit in their house if you're doing many copies. And so that's something to keep in mind. Just depends on what you're going for. Um, what scale should a beginner sculptor work in? I'd say, you know, just around, around, well, this one, this one's like four inches, right? 11 centimeters. So that size up to, um, up to maybe, well, what is this? This is 24 inches. And so this is as big as I go. So in the course, this is as big as I go. This is uh, um, one, four, one third, one third life size scale, I think. And so it's a pretty good size. Um, you know, kind of the size of a bronze sculpture that you might see at a museum or something. A lot of them are around this scale. So it... So yeah, I, you know, do small maquettes. They, their, their advantage is they it can be done quicker even though this one's taken me a while. So maybe I'll stop talking and try to focus on it for a sec. But the whole point of this video was to answer some questions. So let's keep going. He asked, Christopher Lincoln asked quite a few, so let's continue with those. Uh, is there a good or bad way to make an armature? And if so, why? Uh, yeah, the bad way is that it's not proportionate. It's, it doesn't have the right proportions of the figure that you're going for. And so the armature acts not only as structure, but also as a measuring system for your sculpture. So I know, I know that this right here, let's see, can you see that on the, I know that this right here, this little loop, that's this area of the hand. And if, if that's off, if I made the forearm too long or the arm too long or the shoulders too narrow, those are things that are difficult to fix later in the sculpture if the armature is off. You have to like push the armature into the sculpture. It messes things up. So a bad armature is one that's not proportionate. I teach you this method of building armatures. It's my favorite method. Uh, they, they, the, I just, I just really like it. And so it's, it's simple. There's no, there's no uh, wire that you have to cut off. You just use one piece of wire and you make the whole figure. And it uses the, I, I like to use the um, cranial units system that was, uh, that's the Robert Beverly Hale cranial units system. 
that makes the head about 11 and a half heads tall. I really like that, that system. And so, um, as far as that, if it, I mean, if it supports the wire and if the clay sticks to the armature, I mean, that's, that's all you need in an armature. What are some good sources for reference materials, books, websites, videos, etc.? Um, well, obviously, the best, the best resource will be the Proco Figure Sculpting Fundamentals course that's coming out. So be sure you get that. But uh, aside from that, I really like the book by Edward Lanteri, uh, Modeling and Sculpting the Mo Modeling and Sculpting the Human Figure, I believe is what it's called. Um, and that's a great, a great book. He was kind of a, a really good instructor. And you see the knowledge of his knowledge of the figure in his sculptures. The picture on the, the book is like some hands. I don't even think it's by the, the artist because they're kind of crappy hands. But the, the references in the book are very helpful and, uh, and skillfully done. Let's see, any tips for beginners that you wish you knew before getting into sculpting? Things that helped your progress, maybe things to avoid either um, to avoid either you've experienced or have seen others experience. Uh, yeah, yeah, I go through a bunch of those things uh, in, the, in the course. Everything in the course is designed to just make it easier and more state straightforward and to help you not develop bad habits that sculptors often develop. And checking your work with an app like, uh, there's an app called DaVinci Eye, and it's really helpful. Uh, it's, like, it's like five bucks, and it's really helpful to check your, your work. You can take the reference and overlay the image right onto your sculpture. And things like that, there'll be, there'll be tendencies that you have, even from the beginning, to make things um, off. And so maybe you have the tendency to make the legs too short. That's a really common one to make the legs too short. Or maybe, you know, your, your mistake is that you uh, make the head too large or whatever it is. Um, realize that early on, and then you'll be able to counter it. And probably at first, you'll go to the opposite end of the spectrum where then you'll start making the head too small, or you make the legs too long. But that's good You're kind of bouncing back. And then you find that happy medium where things should be. And, and that's what I'd say, um, that's what I'd recommend is, is figuring out yourself early on, because I don't know uh, your style or anything. Um, but if I looked at enough of your sculptures, I might be able to start saying like, oh, okay, I see that you err towards, towards this, this mistake or towards this, um, towards this habit that, that could be resolved. And so things like that are helpful to learn yourself early on by checking your own work with a tool that's objective, like overlaying, you know, images of your reference and the sculpture. Uh, who or, or what has inspired you on your journey as a sculptor, um, as an artist specifically related to sculpture? So the artist, uh, Jason Millward, he's an artist that was going to school the same time I was going to school at Utah State University, and he was a figurative artist, and I saw his sculpture, and that's what made me want to take my first sculpting class. I was like, oh, I really like uh, the way that this sculpture was done, and it just, it just felt very interesting, and I was like, I want to be able to do that. And so he was a big influence, and uh, actually I helped um, I, I started with him and another sculptor, Leroy Transfield, I, I started um, the Intermountain Figure Sculpture Competition, where professional sculptors come and compete for three days, and, and we, can, we can work with each other. And so that's been a really fun experience with professional sculptors, and a lot of them um, are, are, have been doing this their whole life. And so I was, I was the youngest um, in, the, in the group both times that we've had this competition and it was just great to see people that have been working their whole lives and to see their method for approaching the figure their way of building armatures and and their their style it was just really fun and so those people leroy transfield i really like his work as well um those are the uh, the sculptors that come to mind right now um as far as drawing i i love george bridgman 
I love his, his style, and so I really liked the way he pushes the gesture so far. It's just very interesting. And so if, uh, you know, he's, he's one of the famous illustrators for a reason, because he, he has a style that's very interesting to look at. Uh, it's very sculptural, it's very blocky, and so it almost feels like his drawings, they're like cut out of stone, which I really like. And so those are some people that have inspired me. And then also Stan, Stan Prokopenko, I love, you know, his courses. I learned more from his courses than in college, uh, getting my BFA in, in sculpture, but I also took a lot of drawing classes, a lot of painting classes, but they didn't give the kind of knowledge that that Stan has in his videos and so that's why I really like what Proko is doing and continuing to do with this sculpture course. What kind of careers are available? I've talked about that a little bit industrial uh, for professional sculptors and yeah again it, de it depends on what you're interested in whether it's gallery work or whether it's uh, working in an industry like the film industry or or what it is, but but um, you know, a quick Google search will give you a bunch of things that that people are doing right now, and then you have to kind of hone in and say, well, well, what can I try? And then just like I I mentioned, um, going out and, and trying to get in contact with people that are doing what you want to do. Um, George N. Best Man, Best Man, George N. Best Man. One. Uh, first question. How do you get into sculpting and what made you choose sculpting versus an alternative path? Um, I, I took that class in college. <coughs> Excuse me. I took, I took a sculpting class in college and I just fell in love with it. I just really liked working in 3D. I've been drawing my whole life, but after one sculpting class, I just felt like sculpting was, was more enjoyable and that I was actually better at sculpting than drawing. And I'd been drawing my whole life. And so... Um, being able to to take that class that was that was what what changed my mind and I was going into physical therapy pre-physical therapy so I, I liked I like the the figure learning about the body um, but I I just felt like you know what I need to I enjoy art too much and so I need to find a way to make it work and I'm still trying to get there trying to figure out how to to make it work and, and uh, how to reach more people. I like teaching, but I didn't want to go the traditional high school or college um, teaching, teaching method. And so I like what Stan's doing as a, as a company that can reach more people and, and really help people around the world learn about these artistic principles that the masters before us have, have handed down to us. And so we're so blessed to be in a time when there's so much knowledge about drawing and painting and sculpting and, and if we can take advantage of that, we can, we can build off of what they have given us and we can, we can learn from that. And so that's a, a really, we're, we're really blessed to be in this time. And so, um, yeah, I just, just my love for it. My love for sculpting is what made me choose it as opposed to other, other paths. Uh, second question from George, what beginner materials should I acquire? I talked about this early on in the, in the sculpting, uh, the sculpting course, but uh, this this clay is the clay I like. Chavant Medium NSP. I usually get if you get just two pounds, it's expensive. It's like ten dollars a pound. But if you get um, you know uh, six pounds, then it gets a little bit more cost effective. If you get ten pounds, you know the cost per pound goes down a little bit. But I've also I've gotten some clay from Dollar Tree, just from the dollar store that's in my local area, and it's not bad. Like I like it better than some of the professional clays that uh, some of my friends use and it's it's cheap it's like uh, like two dollars a pound whereas like I was saying if you only get two pounds of Chavant clay it's like ten dollars a pound so it's like five times cheaper um, for a small amount of clay and then I just melt you know the color it comes in like a, a variety of colors but I just melt them all together or just choose colors that make like a, a brown color and um, and that works fine if that's if that's what you have that that works and so whatever whatever material you can use uh, works fine it's not the materials as much that matter as much as your ability to sculpt and your knowledge and how much you've practiced sculpting and so that's uh something that's important to to realize that the materials they don't matter as much as uh, other things but it's nice to work with materials that you like 
Uh, third question, in what way are you lacking or think that you could improve uh, skills, understanding, etc., seemingly as advanced as you are, uh, if there are any? Um, so, so, so there's, there's so many things that I, that I need to improve on and I'm always trying to improve. I think that, that artists, we should be like doctors and that we call what we do practice. Um, you know, doctors, it's like, they're, they're, it's their practice. It's like, well, why are you practicing on me? You know, shouldn't you, shouldn't you know what you're doing? But they call it practice because it's, uh, you know, it's experimentation and they're always learning, hopefully. And uh, same thing with artists, like it should be your practice, your, that it's, it's, it's all practice and you're always trying to improve. And that's something that um, with professional sculptors, it gets to a point where you do kind of have to have a little bit of an ego if you're going to be the best, because you have to be able to sell yourself and say like, yeah, pay, pay me a hundred thousand dollars for this, for this monument and I'm worth it. You know, that takes a little bit of an ego, but you you always want to try to remain humble and remember that there's people that are better than you at everything. Like there, unless you're the best in the world, there's always going to be somebody that's better than you. And even if you are the best in the world, you're not the best in the world at everything. And so just trying to, to stay humble. I'm, I'm trying to stay humble and keep learning. I'm not the artist that I want to be. I want to keep improving and learning. And so I am trying to do that. And you know, sometimes it takes time things that, that I need to work on. I'm still learning, you know, anatomy and, and those things are, are complicated. I also, I feel like I'm at the point where I understand more anatomy, but, but that I'm not as subtle as I should be. And so when you're first, when you first learn about a muscle, you make it really defined and it just sticks out, um, too much. But then the masters, they were able to, to then make it more subtle and to feel better than, than, um, than a beginner that just learns like, oh, that's this muscle here. Let me carve out, you know, this one ab muscle. And then it just, it looks like a, a kernel of corn on the cob because there's like these big spaces in between. And so being more subtle, that's something that I'm still working on and, and really incorporating it in a way that, that looks, that looks really good. And some work, some sculptures, I feel like, oh, this one really came together. And sometimes they don't. And so just being able to learn from each, uh, from each sculpture and change things up when they aren't working and not being afraid to make big changes even later on in the process. Um, those are things that, that I've found to be helpful in my own work. Any recommendations? This is George still. still uh, any recommendations of work or sculptures that you admire or enjoy? I've talked about that a little bit already. And so, yeah, the, the artists that I admire. Um, the last question from George, Snickers, Reese's, or other, uh, very sculpture related. So I, I if I was going to choose a candy bar, I probably like Almond Joys with the, the coconut and the almond. And so, but I don't eat candy bars very often. Um, not a, not a huge sweets fan. Um, I mean, sweets are good, but, but yeah, they're okay. So that's, that's what I, that's what I'm going to stick with. Okay, let me, let me come back. Let's see, we're almost, we're, what are we at? Around 40 minutes or something? Okay, let me focus on this sculpture a little bit. So, and I'll just talk about, let's see, can you guys see? So, um, I'm just adding mass where I feel that, that it needs it. I've, I've kind of built it out to where there's a little bit of clay almost on the entire armature. There's still some missing on the hands and the feet, but pretty much everywhere. And now I'm just going to go and try to observe my reference more now that I have kind of a basic study and, and then capture the, the, the feeling of this drawing. And so let me let me try to uh, do that as I continue to go on with these questions. These are great questions, guys. So thank you for everybody at Proco.com that uh, participated and helped me out with some of these questions. Ooh, excuse me. <clears throat> what brought you to sculpture? What keeps you coming for more? Like I said, that was from Tyler C. Um, like I said, Jason Millward, his, his sculpture uh, from 
from college. That's what got me there. And then one college class was enough to make me decide, you know what, I, I really enjoy this and I want to do more of it. And so hopefully if you guys have done drawing, I didn't do sculpture before that. So hopefully if you like drawing, you'll try out sculpture and, um, and you know, find it, I find it as enjoyable as, as, as drawing. And I actually connected more with working in 3D than in 2D. So yeah, I really, I really enjoy it. Just a couple more questions and then we'll finish this up. Um, are there benefits to learning how to physically sculpt that it can apply to learning to sculpt and model that can help um, or that can apply to learning to sculpt and model in digital media? Yeah, so if just like Stan, so Stan talks about this, that he recommends that you learn to draw using traditional materials like, you know, uh, like charcoal on, on a piece of paper because there's a tactile element to that type of learning and there's a muscle memory element. And I'd say the same thing is true with sculpture. Being able to take a piece of clay and build it out and build that sensory um, feedback that you get when you're building out a sculpture physically with clay, it's just, it's just a different experience than sculpting digitally, which I, don't, I only have a little bit of, of experience with, but I found that my, my skills that I've built up sculpting by hand they transfer really easily over to sculpting in 3D in, uh, with digital sculptures. But th doing it the other way around doesn't translate as easily because it takes a lot of muscle memory sculpting on both sides of the figure, sculpting you know, back and forth. And if you're just doing it with a mouse or clicking or even with a, a pen and, and doing it on a laptop, you, know, you don't build that, that tactile uh, information and you don't you don't feel it as much as working with traditional mediums. And so if you're getting into sculpting or if you like sculpting in 3D, I do recommend doing some of the assignments from this course to be able to sculpt um, with traditional, you know, clay and and wire and build the armatures and be able to get that tactile uh, that tactile experience that that really helps as you're developing that that skill to to be able to sculpt. So those are my thoughts about that. Yeah, I, I do recommend working with, with clay. And that was from um, Zachary Chestine, that question. Um, Aiden Graham Cole, what is sketching in sculpture or how does exploration translate from drawing to sculpture? So this is, this is sketching. So this, let's see, this little guy, this is a, a gesture study. That I consider almost like a. See, I feel like this keeps going out of focus. So this is just a gesture study that I'd consider a, a rough sketch, and they can be done pretty quick, especially if it's down on this size. We're almost to to an hour, and I'd say if I wasn't if I wasn't talking and, and answering questions, I would have gotten a lot further. But you can see that it's you know it's it's basically coming along um, with this. And so doing it smaller scale with just adding clay quickly onto the wire, um, that's, that's kind of a sketch. Or even not using a reference at all and just seeing how, how accurate you can get with some of the forms um, is, a, is a great kind of sketch-like exercise. And something you could even do is you know pose a wire armature and then take the pose yourself and take references of yourself in the pose. There's a lesson that goes over how to take references for sculpture in the course, and then come back to the wire armature and then add clay using yourself as a reference. And so that can be a way to sketch that you're, you're seeing like, well, do I like this pose? Put yourself in the pose and then, and then say like, how does this pose feel? What is the emotion that's coming across as I'm in this pose? Those things are, are really, uh, really helpful as you, as you do that. Okay, let's see. Let's see, this is uh, Aiden Graham Cole again. Do you plan on gesture and pose during or before the sculpting process? Do you often find that the, let's see, do you often find your forms or plan where things will be in a drawing? So yeah, sometimes I'll do a drawing ahead of time. Um, I, I don't do it as much now because I often just look for poses that I find interesting and then I'll save reference photos of that pose. And so that's, that's something that I do uh, more. But if it's something that's going to be a project that I'll, that 
that there's a message behind it or it's something that I really want to get across an emotion, I'll take several, uh, I'll do some drawings ahead of time and then I'll take pictures of myself in different poses and then choose which ones that I really feel like get that, get that message across. And so it depends on the project. But if I was like applying for a, a bigger project, I might do several gesture studies in different poses. And I saw uh, Blair, Blair Buswell, who, who does, um, does monuments, does um, bronze monuments. He, he does that. So when he applies for a commission, he'll do several small gesture studies like this. And then he'll do one that's a little bit more developed and say, like, what type of pose would you like this historical figure or this athlete uh, to be in? Because here's some options. Here's five different sculptures. And, and you choose which one you think would, would be the best for this, this person. And so there, there are ways to do that uh, that are very helpful for making a work of art more thought out and, and, um, and better executed. Okay. All right. So I think those are, those are all of the questions. And so now I'm going to, let's see, let me look at the, the pose and see if I'm at an okay place to stop. So maybe I'm just going to add a little bit of muscles here and there, maybe a little bit of this. I like how, um, how George Bridgman does the, the face where you can see the plane change kind of on the side of the cheek. It's kind of similar to the Loomis head. And so I'll just add a little bit more of that, a uh, little bit more clay here in the neck area. And then maybe the little bit of clay for the, for the fist, for the hands. But it's pretty close to a finished gesture study. It's not, it's, not, um, it's not to the point where I'd say like, oh, this is a gesture study that I like enough to where I would take a mold and, and cast it and, and sell it. But just as a gesture study from a, a drawing, it's, it's uh, coming together and I'm liking how it's looking. And so I think, let's see. I'm gonna, just going to, and you can see I can just kind of push these forms if I feel like they're not quite right. Um, it's still pretty easy, even with the clay on top, to, to push the, the armature. And we'll see. Just looking at the drawing, looking back and forth for my reference to the sculpture, and making sure that they are kind of coming together. And let's make this video an hour. So what does that give me? Two more minutes. Two more minutes just to work on this, this gesture study. So it's really close to being finished. I'm just going to add this, this foot with a little bit of clay. And hopefully uh, this was fun for you guys. And you uh, are excited for the course. I'm so excited. It's been a lot of work. It's been a lot of time getting it ready. And, and Stan and his team have done a great job if, of editing it, to get, editing it together. And, uh, and so I'm so grateful to be working with them. They're doing amazing things for art students all over. So it's great to be a part of it. Hopefully you guys will be a part of it. Hopefully you'll be able to purchase the course and, and help Proco continue to do things like this um, and, and support Proco. What they're doing, I think, is really, really going to be helpful. They're making a space for artists to learn outside of the traditional college experience, which I, I personally think is just getting too expensive for the amount of knowledge and, and uh, for what they offer. It's just too expensive. So I'm really, help, I'm really glad to be a part of what Proco is doing to, to make it more accessible, high quality art education, more accessible to people around the world. And hopefully if you have the funds, hopefully you can support it by purchasing the courses that, that will help you as an, as an artist or just as somebody that enjoys art, you know? Uh, and it, they're some of the best, the best courses that you can find online. Okay, just recently some new questions came in, so I wanted to address those and maybe make a few adjustments to this. And so um, Hope Wolf asks, asked a great question. He said, these are incredible, thank you. Talking about the, the images I used. I would love to know how to get things ready and prepared when an idea strikes. Do you always have to build an armature first? 
I feel like I get discouraged because by the um, because just the thought of building a wire armature first gets me when I don't even want to get to get started because by the time I build the armature, my idea is gone or the inspiration. So how do you build a sell setup and workflow that will not kill or diminish the idea when inspiration strikes? Or do, does sculpting always require planning and is not really a medium that you can just grab and create away whatever uh, it is that you want on the fly? So um, I heard a, a quote that was addressed at artist and it said uh, inspiration is for amateurs inspiration is for amateurs and so um, i think that applies a little bit here and what that quote means is that sometimes um, you have to work when you're not inspired and you you have to be able to create even when you're not feeling that artistic you have to be able to practice you have to be able to create and you have to be able to finish product products even when you're not feeling in the mood, in that creative mood. And so that's the first thing that, that comes to mind when I think about that. But there are things that you can do so that when an idea comes to you, you, you have a, a setup where you're ready to, um, to record that idea. And so that's, that's why a sketchbook is great. Even for sculptors, you can draw a pose much quicker than you can um, make the pose with a, with a sculpture. Sculpture takes a little bit more time to develop. You're thinking about the pose from every angle as opposed to just one angle. So if you're trying to, if you're trying to get an idea down quickly, a sketchbook um, or an electronic device where you can, where you can digitally you know, draw out the idea, a, a simple gesture study for the idea or for the concept and write some notes in there, um, that's, that's a, a way that a lot of sculptors use. Um, and that's why drawing is a very good tool to have even for a sculpture, even for a sculptor. So that's one of the things you can do. Also, as far as building armatures, yeah, I, I prefer to have an armature whenever I am working because it just, it just makes the measurements so easy. You don't have to think about it as much. If you're sculpting just a piece of clay and trying to build a figure out of it, then you have to be thinking about the proportions constantly and measuring and making sure that you're on track. But if you have an armature already there, you can pose it and then you know that all the proportions are in place. And so that's why I, I really recommend uh, learning how to build an armature and build one quickly. These, these types of armatures that I'll show you how to build, um, I've gotten to the point where I can build them in under 10 minutes. And so uh, that might still seem like a long time, compared to you know a drawing that you can just get out and so you have to keep that in mind but I do like to build several armatures in a setting so I'll be listening to a podcast or an audiobook and I'll just build armatures so that when the idea does strike or when I need something for a gesture study or there's a modeling session that I'm going to go to I have them ready I have a few ready and on hand so that I'm not having to build it on the spot and so that's something else that can help uh, with that. So uh, as I'm looking at this, this gesture study, I feel like the head is too big. And so I'm going to remove a little bit of mass in the head. Um, that's just something that's jumping out at me. And so making those, those adjustments. If you see something's wrong, you know, change it. And so that's already feeling, feeling better. Um, just removing some clay. From the head, it's not. It wasn't too thick. It was just too tall, and it made it feel like a little kid um, sculpture instead of a, an adult, which is which is what the Bridgman drawing is of. Okay, let's see. So this one's from oh, so so that question was from Hope Wolf, and then this next question um, is from Bade, Bader Bader Art. Vader Art, and they ask, um, I hope you cover the technique of starting with the blocks and then carving out the details. So that's referring to um, subtractive sculpture. That's stone sculpture or starting with a plaster block and, and chipping away things. Um, stone sculpture is subtractive because you're removing material to sculpt. The course that I'll be going over is additive. And I talk about this a little bit in the course. And the reason for that is it's more forgiving. So if you're just learning sculpture, um, with a, a clay sculpture, you can add pieces and then you add too much in some areas. So you, you, you remove some 
material. Uh, you can use tools to scrape away the surface. But with stone sculpture, it's very unforgiving and you have to be accurate or else, you know, the sculpture will get, get smaller and smaller. If you, if you um, make a mistake, then you have to make the entire sculpture smaller to fit inside the, the stone. And, and with that, the proportions might change or things like that. So um, I'm hoping that I will do a stone sculpting course that'll go over tools for stone sculpture. I enjoy stone sculpture. And so I'm hoping that that will be a future course um, that, that, is, that, is, that really focuses in on stone sculpture, the tools you need, the types of stone, um, you know, where you can get supplies and, and everything you'd want to know if you're gonna do a, a stone sculpture. But even with stone sculpture, you're gonna want to make a maquette, a small model out of, out of clay, and then, and then be able to use that as a reference for the stone sculpture. And so it's very rare that a, a stone carver, unless he has years of experience, will just carve into a stone without some type of reference. So they usually have a maquette. Sometimes they even have a maquette and a point machine, which is a machine that helps you um, uh, measure out, you know, the spaces and, and be able to take your reference and, and see like the nose is this deep into the stone and then the, eye, the cheek is this deep. And so the, that point machine helps you give you a few points that you know are accurate and then you can, you know, carve the stone in. And so there's a lot of um, tips and, and tools and things that I'd love to get into in a more in-depth course. And so we'll see if that comes in the future. It won't be the next course. If I do another course, that'll probably be a portrait portrait drawing course. So I'll dive into the details of portraiture and, and trying to capture a likeness and things like that. Um, but a stone sculpting course is something that I'd love to get into uh, if, if possible, because it is really fun. And it's hard to compete with a well done stone sculpture as far as finish goes. A stone sculpture, it just looks so nice. And it, and it has a weight to it. And it has a presence that other materials, even bronze, I just, I just feel like a, a good stone sculpture is so uh, so much more impressive. And that's why I do stone sculpture when I go to shows because, um, and those are a little bit more abstract. I like to do an abstract style, but I will be getting into a more realistic style soon. Um, but even in that abstract style, I feel like it has a presence and I can ask a little bit more money without feeling um, that, it, that it's not worth it. I think with, with a drawing or a painting, I'd have a hard time pricing my work, but with a stone sculpture, it has a weight to it. It has a, a intrinsic value and beauty in the stone. And so, yeah, that is something that I, I, I hope to cover in, in an upcoming course. Okay, SBM asks, I wish to know all the materials that can be used safely, uh, that can safely be used as armatures that can be fired in a kiln. So firing in a kiln, you're referring to water-based clay or... Um, something like terracotta or porcelain. Those are all types of, of um, water-based clay or natural clay, sometimes it's called. And it's not the clay that I recommend for the course because um, you're learning how to sculpt. And so I recommend an oil-based clay like this that doesn't dry out so that you can use it and reuse it. So, it's, so this piece, if I, if I fired it in a kiln, it'd just melt. The whole thing would melt um, because it's an oil-based clay. It doesn't dry out. So you can't, um, you can't use an armature in water-based clay because as, the, as you fire it, the armature won't shrink or expand at the same rate as the, as the clay. And so there'll be cracking in it. So if you're going to sculpt using water-based clay, you have to sculpt it out and then, um, and then remove the armature. And so th it's, it's a, a whole process in and of itself. If you're doing a sculpture, it, it sometimes, if you're doing like a torso, for example, it's sometimes just better to build out a cylinder, a tube, and then build out all the details and then maybe cut it in half and remove the excess clay uh, because it has to be hollow. They can't be, uh, you know, uh, solid all the way through. And so I talk about that a little bit when I go over clays. It'll be in a premium lesson where I'll dive a little bit deeper into the materials. But uh, if you're using water-based clay, you can use it for the same practices, but with an armature, you can't fire it. You won't be able to fire it. So keep that in mind. Um, that's, that's just the way it is. For If I want to make something permanent, I'll make a mold and I'll cast it. 
and and I'll go over some of that process as well in in the course. Let's see. Yeah, so I think those are all the questions. And that uh, that head's feeling a little bit better right now. And I think I think that's where I'm going to leave where I'm going to leave this sculpture for for right now. Maybe there's a little bit more that could be removed from the head. And it is a little little thin from side to side. That's okay. And so there's that. So be sure that you're over on the new Proco 3D channel because that's where the videos, the free videos for the Figure Sculpting Fundamentals course, they'll all be over there. So be sure you're subscribed to that channel if you're interested in sculpture. It'll really help us out if you like, share, and subscribe to, to that channel. And the, the course is out for pre-sale. So if you can, join all of those. There's been so many people. I appreciate so much the support. For those who that have already purchased it, if you want that discount, be sure to get it before the 8th. That's when the discount ends. So go on over there to proco.com slash sculpture and, and get the full course. I've worked really hard on it. Uh, Stan's team has been amazing. They've worked really hard on it. And so help us uh, do more of this. I want to I wanna do more. I want to uh, keep going with these courses and hopefully it's worth it for you guys. And and it's just been a great a great thing a great process so i hope to see you over there i hope that you'll submit the assignments that we go over in the in the course so that i can use yours as example videos uh as examples for the critique videos and and yeah i i hope to see you over there thank you for watching thank you for supporting proco and i'll see you around